you probably all know uh, that the Oxford to Cambridge arc is an area of national economic priority identified and endorsed by the UK government. And this stems from proposals made by the National Infrastructure Commission. On the map of England, the arc is Oxfordshire, Northamptonshire, Buckinghamshire, Bedfordshire and Cambridgeshire. The arc leaders group is a collaboration of most local authority leaders, lectures and university sector representatives from across that geography. Membership of the ARC Leaders Group is entirely voluntary. And so to the economic prospectus. Why do we have an economic prospectus? In short, it's about growth that creates better quality opportunities for residents and businesses now and in the future. We aim to be the home to world leading innovations that seek to address climate change. It's a place where a protected environment, natural resources, and the health and well being of people are fundamental aspects of our economic vision. Now, we do recognise our immediate situation in respect of the COVID uh, crisis, and we believe that there is a role uh, in responding to the economic recovery of our country, and that is, if you like, a backdrop to this economic prospectus. Uh, that's all that I, I have to say for as an introduction, and I hope very much that you find what we have to say today uh, to be of interest and of value. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barry, uh, and, and really appreciate the words around the the commitment around not just the the fantastic growth opportunities that are here for the future, but the but the need to focus on recovery at the moment. And I'm sure that'll be some of the themes of some of the questions that we'll be taking uh, later on. Thanks very much, Barry. Um, at this point, I think on the program, we were going to have Emran Mian from the government speaking. We've been having some technical issues getting Emran onto the uh, onto the schedule. So if 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 you can if I can beg your indulgence while we try to work that out. Um, we'll ask if uh, Bridget Smith, uh, leader of uh, South Cambridge District Council, can come and speak. Bridget is the lead of our Environment Work Stream. I'm um, very excited the work that we're doing around the Green Arc, um, a, a principle that I know she's going to talk to you about, and, and how fundamental uh, working with the environment underpins the principles of the Arc going forward. Uh, Bridget, can I turn it over to you, please? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bev. And um, it's a real pleasure to be here today. I'm just sorry that I'm not seeing you all in person. So it's not been an easy journey over the past three years to get to this point where the branding, the green arc, defines the overarching vision for Oxcam. But it's to the huge credit of our many partners, including government, the LEPs, all the council leaders and the ARC universities group that this is where we are now at. And I'm more than delighted to be leading the Oxcam ARC Environment Working Group, which consists of a large and hugely impressive, highly committed group of organisations and individuals who have all stuck enthusiastically with us through thick and thin to cement the ARC's firm commitment to be really, really green. But to start with, let me be clear about why I believe the green in the Oxcam arc is the most critical element that will determine its success and why, if we get this wrong, the consequences will be dire. Now, during the numerous meetings of the many council leaders across the arc geography, the one thing that we consistently agreed upon was the need to be able to be, a, to be able to clearly articulate what was in it for the 3.7 million people already living in the ARC, as well as for all those people who will be living there in the near and distant future. 
and also how the art can be so very, very much more than just the sum of its parts. And we can do this through the very best in spatial planning, through innovation and a truly shared vision. To begin with, we had to take a leap of faith and stop thinking about the art in terms of problems to be solved. And that's often the, the pitfall of many, many projects. And we had to move on to focusing on the huge opportunities to be explored and exploited and which we knew that government were already cited on. It was an easy step for us all to agree that the biggest opportunity and the biggest need was to do something radical that addressed the world climate crisis and which could create an international exemplar for zero carbon living and natural capital gain. So what do I mean when I talk about the green arc? And what do I mean when I talk about the environment being the overarching opportunity to do things differently and to do things much, much better? For a start, what I don't mean is just the nice, soft, fluffy stuff. The environmental opportunities represent hard cash and hard benefits. So the environment, the environment Working Group's starting point has been to look at the opportunities to protect, enhance and increase green and blue spaces within the ARC. And that, of course, is of great interest and significance to the people living there already. And we've begun in a small way by adopting the Dublin Nature Vision, which was created by Natural Cambridgeshire, which is my own environment, environment body and which has been adopted by my own council and by the Cambridge and Peterborough Combined Authority. And that's a response to the huge deficit at our end of the arc in biodiversity, tree cover and managed green space. South Cambridgeshire, which is my council, has fewer trees than anywhere else in the country. And we need to do something dramatic about that. Now I'm confident that this is a good start. Doubling the amount of well-managed, well-connected green and blue space, planting many thousands of trees and dramatically increasing biodiversity will go an awful long way to winning the hearts and minds of the people in the ark and showing them that there is indeed something in it for them which will improve their quality of life as well as their health and well-being and as we're in the middle of a pandemic we know how absolutely critical that is. So who would not love to be able to walk or cycle from Cambridge to Oxford uninterrupted through the very best in well-connected, well-protected, well-managed green space? As a long distance walker, I certainly would love to do that. But it's not all about nature. There is so very, very much more we can do to really make a difference. My own vision for my council of South Cambridgeshire is that we are the greenest district council in the country. And so if I can aspire to that for my little district, why can the ARC not aspire to be the greenest region in the world? And why should it not be internationally recognized as something radically different, an exemplar of bright green, zero carbon living, a place where people really want to come and live because their quality of life is so much enhanced, their opportunity is so much improved, and which most vitally plays a significant and active part in combating world climate change. So the art can be a test bed for low carbon living innovation, a living lab of experimentation led by the ARC's outstanding universities. A place where we're not afraid to try things out, to do things differently and to even fail at times. A place from which radical new solutions to climate change are rolled out worldwide and where, as a consequence, the world wants to come to do business. But we have to move on from yesterday's narrative that's about minimising and mitigating for damage to one that talks about maximising opportunities and benefits. 
And most importantly of all, we must not forget the Oxchem Arc, the Green Arc, is all about people. The people living there now, the people who will live there in the future. So what does this mean for them? So what I really hope it will mean is that we maximise net environmental gain and biodiversity net gain by creating an outstanding network of well-managed, easily accessible, well-connected, high quality green and blue spaces and that we work with our landowners to significantly increase investment in existing and future natural capital assets. That we maximise every opportunity to decarbonise transport, including the electrification of rail and cutting edge future models of sustainable public transport alongside active travel infrastructure, linking communities and workplaces that will be so successful that car ownership becomes optional and even undesirable. That we maximise the existing green economy in the ARC to create an environment where green R&D, green tech and innovation and green manufacturing will flourish. Where each is part of each other's supply chain, supporting the local economy in turn. So how great will it be if every house built in the ARC includes photovoltaic panels and all those photovoltaic panels are manufactured in the ARC? So we maximise truly green construction methods, and this is something I'm really passionate about. Homes and premises built to the highest energy efficient standards using cutting edge modern methods of construction with low embedded carbon, high levels of locally produced renewable energy and even loos that routinely flush with rainwater as standard. Homes built close to where people work, to where they learn, to where they play and even where everyone can grow their own food. Where we maximise water conservation in homes and we have regional water management strategies so that rivers and streams flow all year round and ponds are full and playing their part in biodiversity gain. Where we can maximise opportunities for early multi-agency engagement to plan a progress and progressively deploy a coherent, integrated and synergistic energy infrastructure embracing future smart grid and DC transmission technologies to maximise the generation, transmission, aggregation, storage and distribution of clean energy at the highest efficiency. That would be really radical. Where we maximise new methods of recyc recycling whilst dramatically reducing waste. And most importantly for me as a council leader, we maximise people's health and well-being to build and secure the sort of resilient communities that we now know are so critical to overcoming pandemics, which are without doubt and very sadly linked to climate change. And I know there will be more and more opportunities as time goes by that we're not even aware of now, but with the expertise of our universities, we will soon be made aware. And so for someone living in the green arc, what will life be like? Well, they will live in a truly smart home that's cheap to run because of its high construction standards and its reliance on renewable energy. And they may not even need to own a car because they can walk or cycle to their job in the green economy or travel on high quality, affordable and clean public transport. They'll have more free income to spend on having a good life. Their air will be clean. They will be easily able to access beautiful, well-managed and biodiverse green and blue spaces. They'll grow their own food or buy locally grown produce. Recycling will be easy. They will be fitter and healthier and happier because of where they live and work. And if we get this right, the green arc will be the 21st century good life. But before I finish, a couple of words of warning. 
Recent history is full of examples of fabulous and ambitious visions which have failed to deliver because conflicting interests, lack of commitment have chipped away at them over time and, and compromise has resulted in the outcomes being reduced or even completely negated. Done badly, the Oxcam arc, the green arc, could lead to significant increases in carbon emissions and further irreversible damage to nature, undermining UK commitments to rapidly decarbonising our economy, our transport and our housing, and to the restoration of our very degraded natural world. So let us be the face of cutting, end, sorry, cutting edge sustainability, rather than give the lie to those that claim that this is just greenwash. We have a unique opportunity here to create something great, but we need all our partners, government, local councils, universities, LEPs, developers, manufacturers, environmental groups, and the people and businesses of the ARC to help us and support us and to hold us all true to the vision of a truly green ARC. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, that was, your passion for this subject is, 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 is very, very obvious to all who listen to you speak. And I think one of the things that's got to be clear to people, I don't want to get ahead of the questions, but it is this passion about influencing and shaping the arc, which I think is what brings leaders like yourself to this group. And I think that's the point, which is growth is inevitable in some respects in this part of the world because of the success we have, but we can do it right. We can do it better and we can deliver the change right at the forefront of, of, of a global change that's necessary. And I think we're, the, 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 one of the things that gets me most excited with the opportunity of the ARC is indeed this, uh, this opportunity to change things. And so thanks very much. That's very, very excellent. I'm sure there's going to, in fact, I can see already there's several questions on this. So I'll be back to you very shortly. Thanks, Bridget. Thank um, now I'm going to move, switch your gears into, um, back to this, the, 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 the overwhelming or the overriding principle of this region which is its economic significance and the role it will play in, in, in UK, UK PLC meeting its targets um, and driving, driving positive economic growth for the future. I'm going to bring in uh, Jeremy Long, chair of the Oxfordshire Local Enterprise Partnership, but also the lead chair for the member local enterprise partnerships and business boards as part of the ARC leadership group. And I'm going to ask Jeremy to talk a little bit about the sector strengths and the, and the, and the strong working between the local enterprise partnerships in this part of the world. Jeremy, thank you. Thank you, Beth, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, before I do talk about the ARC, um, the term LEP, Local Enterprise Partnership, has been mentioned a few times today. Let me just take a couple of minutes uh, just to explain what a LEP is, Local Enterprise Partnership is. Um, these are government uh, formed organizations uh, that have existed now for almost a decade. Their aim is on a local basis to bring together people who have a view about the economic prosperity, the future of their particular region. So in the case of Oxfordshire, we bring together the local authority leaders for Oxfordshire. Um, we bring together the heads of the HE and FE organizations and a, uh, a range of business people with a range of sectoral uh, expertise from uh, a cross section of the businesses in Oxford and Oxfordshire. And our aim is threefold. Our aim is to, uh, at a point in time, to have a vision, uh, a strategy for the region. Uh, and we bring together specialists who may be transport, they may be hospitality, they may be sectoral from other sectors, uh, specialists in innovation uh, from the universities, for example. We bring together specialists who can then help shape the strategies for the region. Secondly, we deliver support programs, particularly for young people. Uh, in skills uh, and also for young and growing small businesses uh, where we operate uh, talent classes, skills, uh, improvement uh, classes, work experience programs uh, for many young people and for many uh, small and growing organizations to help them prosper. And then thirdly, uh, we bid for funds. Uh, government from time to time 
will make available funds competitively for regions to bid for, to put forward business cases for why their region uh, should uh, be the recipient of funds to then invest. Invest either in augmented skills and business support programmes or to invest in capital projects. And to date for Oxfordshire, uh, we are partway through delivering about £600 million worth of projects uh, which have been won competitively from a range of government funds that have been made available since the LEPs were first created. The LEPs across the arc have been working very uh, productively together over the last three years since really the first notion of the arc first came into being. We were first challenged individually as organisations to produce our own industrial strategies. Uh, the government about three years ago announced its intention to produce a national industrial strategy and asked each LEP in its respective region to bring forward its contribution uh, and the way that its own region uh, could meet what were des described as the challenges of our, our society going forward and how we could contribute uh, to our local economies and nationally. As the ARC, we're one of the very few regions in the country where we make a net contribution to government funds. We're one of the regions where the economic prosperity is such that we do not take a net uh, level of taxation from the Exchequer, we contribute to it. And it is that underlying strength in the economy which we know will be able to shape our recovery in the short term and will be able to shape the nations as a whole in the longer term. Let me just draw on some of the strengths that the ARC has, some of the industries which are already uh, world leading uh, in their own particular fields and are being recognised by the government as areas of considerable economic potential. We have, and I'm sure all of us at the moment, are very conscious of the strengths that we have in life sciences, not just in Oxford, with the focus that there is on the vaccine work going on in Oxford University, but also in Cambridge, long-standing life science specialisms, uh, which take us, as I said, in, in, in the world, right up amongst uh, those uh, well-beating uh, clinical treatments. And life sciences and the research and development money going into life sciences is seen as one of the areas where this country will remain preeminent uh, in years to come. Aviation. There is a considerable move right now to look at how long term aviation can be made sustainable. And there is groundbreaking work going on in Cranfield, uh, which I suspect that Sir Peter Gregson will be referring to shortly, where the world of aviation is being turned on its head in order that uh, aviation fuel, energy, uh, can be revolutionised over the decade to come. Connected vehicles, autonomous vehicles. We have uh, some of the country's leading work going on in our universities and with small and, and increasingly important uh, businesses clustered around the universities, developing the future of autonomous vehicles. Films, Pinewood um, in Buckinghamshire, one of the leading uh, film production facilities uh, in the world uh, with a, an enormous order book of film, films that now wish to be produced here in this country rather than elsewhere overseas. Space. We are one of the country's leading focuses of innovation in space technology, particularly satellite technology, which will go on providing us with improved telecommunications, mapping uh, and advanced uh, technologies, which we will all increasingly depend on uh, through the use of our own devices. And as Bridget has just been referring to, a considerable range of environmental energy waste businesses. And as Bridget said, where this is something that we can prosper from as well as benefiting from, benefiting from as residents and, and in our own communities. We have a large number of increasingly novel uh, en energy and environmental businesses that are tackling some of the challenges we face in, in as the climate change emergency 
is taken forward by all of us. These are just some of the industries that we have already established and already are making their mark, not just in this country, but internationally. And we know that government sees the enormous research and development capability that there is across our universities as being one of the ways that this country can continue to sustain itself economically as we go forward as an independent nation. And that research and development, and it's interesting, a report produced only a couple of, a couple of days ago, has very much focused attention on commercial opportunities for research and development. And across the arc, we have a striking number of those commercial opportunities. So what, on behalf of the ARC, what do we see as the asks of government? Well, we know that there are certain investments which only government can make. And however willing the private sector is to come and invest here, or individuals, entrepreneurs, academics, to come and live and work here, we know that there is a backbone to any region which requires government investment as a catalyst for what can then be the private sector, the personal commitments that can follow on. So in the case of the ARC, we know that there is a need for transport investment. Bridget has already referred to the East-West Railway. We need that communication uh, to be put in place to enable people to be able to move more easily in and around the ARC. We need digital communication. We need the investment to enable this to be one of the best connected regions in the country and to match the kind of connectivity that is available elsewhere in the world and becomes increasingly a competitive edge for those who internationally may be deciding where they choose to come and live or work or base their business. We need the maximum joined up effort and understanding across all government. We need every department in government to have an appreciation of the ARC and its potential and to work together. As Bridget said, this can very, very much be more than the sum of its parts. And we need that catalytic research and development expenditure to continue. There is a considerable payback all the evidence shows that the successful spin outs that there already been from our universities, we can continue to create the businesses of the future if we're given the right support by government and given the discretion to look at how we fund both capital and revenue projects, particularly into areas where we know that we need skills enhancement or skills retraining across the arc to enable everyone to be able to participate in its future prosperity. This is a tremendous region with enormous strengths and appeal. It is a great place to live and work and to come and bring one's talent. We know that it has tremendous future and we very much look forward as the LEPs to working together to help bring that about. Thank you. Jeremy, thanks very much. And I think it's really, really great to hear that, um, you know, there's there's obviously the very exciting projects. We're going to hear a bit more about that from Sir Peter, but we are really talking about ground level, base level, community level support here around skills and enterprise. It's very important and it gets lost sometimes in some of the headlines. I think it's important to remind people of the work that the LEPs and the business partners do um, across the arc and across the country indeed. But but certainly how important that is to underpinning the work we're doing, along with the really exciting work, obviously, that we're, we're, we're trying to take hold of. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Appreciate that. Um, I'm going to turn now, if I can, to um, Sir Peter Gregson, Professor Sir Peter Gregson, um, who's going to take us through some of the work of the ARC University Group and, and um, some exciting stuff, uh, Peter, to really take us through. Uh, and, and, you know, we've been very excited to see it be part of the perspectives go forward. And I know you're very, um, very, very passionate about the work that's being done there. So look very, very, very forward uh, to you summarizing some of that work for, for the audience. Thanks very much for joining us, Sir Peter. Muted at the moment. I'm now unmuted. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Bev. 
Uh, and uh, let me say, colleagues, that uh, I'm sorry, I've only just been able to join you, but I got the last few minutes of uh, Jeremy Long's uh, presentation there. I think his uh, infectious ambition and his commitment to this region and to the ARC is something that I'd just like to, to build on. Um, I'll try not to repeat uh, so much of the vision that he's laid out, uh, rather to reflect on how our universities can support that vision and also their commitment to do just that. So I'll make a few introductory comments uh, first of all. Um, and the first one is that the, this arc, unlike many parts of the UK, really does have the critical mass of research and expertise, entrepreneurship and innovation that really must be the ingredients for exceptional growth at a regional level. Uh, if we can harness those in an even better way than we have in the past, then I think we have the opportunity to, to fuel the economic recovery that is so essential on the back of COVID, uh, and also to provide the jobs that will underpin the leveling up agenda. Because as Jeremy has rightly said, this uh, arc, this region is a net contributor if we can harness the strength of this region to grow at a disproportionate rate, then of course, we will be supporting leveling up and jobs within this region and beyond. Uh, and that is what is so crucial in the way in which we approach the ask to government. Uh, the second point that I want to make is that I think that this arc has the ambition to deliver on a global scale, but to do so, we can't just do it on how we live and work, etc. at the moment. We know that there is a challenge to connect our people better. We know that we need to develop an environment where our sectors and our industries can start developing more prolific clusters that grow to having critical mass uh, and therefore for the companies here in the UK, here in this arc, to grow and thrive and not be taken either into overseas ownership or be taken overseas. I think this is also an area and a great location for growing the population to have a high quality of life. That's especially why the earlier remarks from Councillor Bridget Smith have particular resonance for all the universities. We believe that quality of life within this uh, region is absolutely crucial. And therefore the concept of a resurgent uh, post COVID green arc is so attractive and want to be supported by our universities. The third point that I want to make is uh, to reinforce the point that Jeremy made and go a tiny bit further. Of course, this arc is defined by the two global university giants at either end. Oxford and Cambridge are absolutely crucial, not to the arc, but to the world. And we've seen that in response to the COVID crisis and how uh, the science and the life sciences at both Oxford and Cambridge will be used to underpin future vaccines. So the universities at either end are crucial. I also, and forgive me for um, probably bringing to bear some of the, 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 the background that I had when I chaired the Milton Keynes 2050 Futures Commission, but we also have in Milton Keynes a very fast growing city, uh, soon to have half a million inhabitants uh, at the heart of this arc. And in the same way as Oxford and Cambridge are world leaders in the uh, spin outs, the quality of the spin outs, the number of the spin outs emerging in those two great cities. In Milton Keynes, from its very short history, there is a history of startup companies 
growing to a small extent, but not growing sufficiently to really add to uh, to the uh, regional uh, economic growth in the way that they could do if we were more uh, joined up. So Oxford and Cambridge, Milton Keynes, and the last, but by no means least, of uh, the, the triumvirate, our closeness to London and the capital markets. It's that that I believe becomes the compelling pros uh, proposition as the ARC tries to develop an, uh, an international strategy for inward investment. So it, my, my comments are going to be very much framed by, by those uh, overarching observations. It would be remiss if I didn't say something about the ARC Universities Group. I think many people on this uh, webinar today will have heard of it. Uh, in a way, it was the universities that got behind the uh, original ideas from the National Infrastructure Commission and came together in a way that could, without trying to uh, emasculate any of the um, uh, distinctive features of the universities, but in, in, a, in a form of mutual collaboration, be a vehicle to support the type of vision that Jeremy, that Jeremy has, has laid out. So we have nine very different universities. Uh, if I start in the West, we've got University of Oxford, then Oxford Brooks, uh, then uh, Bucks New University, Moving into the Milton Keynes arena and area, we have uh, Cranfield, uh, University of Bedfordshire, University of Northampton, uh, and the Open University. Uh, and then moving further east, of course, the University of Cambridge and Anglia Ruskin University. Nine very, very different universities, but came together in very short order and developed the first prospectus. This was a universities only prospectus where the universities uh, laid out some of the ways in which they could support the region in any future emerging economic prospectus. Obviously that prospectus, the university one, has now largely been overtaken by the economic prospectus developed by the ARC and to which the universities will once again respond. In coming together, the universities themselves have appointed a director. They have half funded that director, government providing the other half funds, but we need to get that on a secure footing. Uh, Alistair Lomax is doing a sterling job as a single point of contact for government, working into the ARC universities and also feeding uh, issues uh, back, largely issues that have emerged from the LEPs. Uh, back into government that, that impinge on the universities themselves. If that was phase one, we're now entering phase two because as of this month, we have the inaugural meeting of a new governing board for this activity that will involve the vice chancellors of all the universities uh, with the pro vice chancellors uh, respectively at Oxford and Cambridge on that board. That's going to provide the strategic direction for an operating board that will be there supporting and in some cases leading some of the big projects that will emerge from the strengths that Jeremy, that Jeremy has already highlighted. So I hope that that, will, that outlines the sort of uh, stages of development that we're at. In terms of the ARC Universities Group, we are committed to supporting this ARC initiative in developing its research, its innovation and skills at the various different levels. And that's something that we will be uh, clearly uh, developing in the uh, months and years ahead. So what are the key projects that the ARC Universities Group is working on already and supporting the, uh, the ARC uh, and where are those that are still left to, that are still going to be developed. I'm going to start with two cross-cutting areas 
that are in the economic prospectus. The first is the green arc, and you'll have heard about that from Councillor Bridget Smith. Uh, the the um, ARC Universities Group are about to release a report showing the major capabilities that exist across our universities. They are being drawn together by the ARC Universities Environment Partnership Board. That's led by Simon Pollard and Michelle Kane. And there's a webinar on the 15th, on Friday, the 20th of November, that's this coming Friday, uh, which will launch that report. I think this is an opportunity to show how joined up the universities and the enthusiasm within the universities is becoming to the wider region. And in the video clip that we're just about to see, you'll see Simon Pollard and Bridget Smith really coming together to speak with enthusiasm about the ambition for the green arc. I'm hoping that somebody is going to run the video. The thing that will make the Oxford Cambridge Arc distinctive and will really make us stand out is if we put the green economic agenda at its very heart. The universities in the Arc have a world leading environment capability. It's that engagement with the universities which will allow us to really capture all this emerging best practice. Skills, innovation, research and training. The environment has to be the overarching umbrella over all the ARC's ambition. I'm really hoping the ARC will be a major contribution to the green economy. The challenge is to bring everybody together. I'm really excited. It's got the opportunity to be a powerhouse of innovation in the highest quality environment in the world. And it is a model that we can share with the rest of the world on how to do it right. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So just returning to the cross cutting areas, I think the point that I wanted to get across in that video clip was that our universities are all global. We also all look locally and regionally. At the end of the day, we are here to uh, to uh, ensure that the global talent that we have in our universities is used to local advantage. And I think that's what you were seeing there. But more particularly, there's a real effort and ambition now, I think, for universities to be joined up with elected representatives in the region, as well as with businesses in the region, to make sure that we can practice what we preach on our doorsteps. The second cross-cutting area in the economic prospectus is the digital lab. There's some exceptional work of very long standing at both Oxford and Cambridge. That's Jim Hall at Oxford and Jennifer Schooling at Cambridge to model the arc, turn the arc itself into a digital laboratory. That's now being supported by the work of Steve Hallett at Cranfield. Uh, Steve is one of the digital champions for the cabinet office. Uh, and in this way, where we believe that we've got a capability within the arc of really turning this arc into a digital laboratory for the future and use that 
as a way of looking at the impact of development on environment, planning, and our economy. Uh, that's at a slightly earlier stage, but again, I would hope that very soon it, it carries with it the same sort of uh, enthusiasm that we saw in that, um, in, that, in that video clip. So to the projects that are also um, identified in the prospectus, uh, I'd like to, uh, I don't want to go where Jeremy's done a fantastic introduction to all the activities. Uh, Jeremy's right in highlighting some that are at early stages of development. Uh, in that category, I would put the whole area of the future of mobility uh, to strengthen the hub as a center for the development, testing and rollout for connected and autonomous vehicles uh, and all the underpinning uh, clean fuel technologies that are important. We have a world leading capability here in our universities at Millbrook Proving Ground and uh, within some of the companies. Uh, and clearly uh, where I'm speaking from, we have Nissan just on our doorstep. So that's an important area. So too is the whole area of zero, zero carbon energy and the way in which we need to develop new energy solutions through battery technology renewables. Uh, and we have, again, a raft of companies uh, throughout the arc that are in this field. Uh, so too, we have interests in the arc in the whole area of generating clean energy for residential, industrial and commercial uh, use. Those three areas, I think we've yet to put together into a coherent project or two. Uh, they are really important innovation areas which we within the ARC universities would want to carry on developing. But I don't think there is a very clear project in that in, in any of those areas yet. On the contrary, three areas that very much do have projects associated with them. Jeremy has already alluded to the life sciences network, really underpinned by the world leading work at Oxford and Cambridge. And that, that should undoubtedly lead to this arc becoming a destination for spin outs, uh, for collaboration, innovation, and commercialization in anything that's underpinned by world class life science um, research. Um, so that's, that's one getting very well developed, and at the launch of the governing body of the ARC Universities Group. That's the one that we'll be highlighting at that stage. Jeremy also uh, highlighted the key strengths in the, air, uh, the ARC Space Gateway. Uh, and again, there's a project coming together, drawing together the expertise at Harwell, Westcott, uh, Oxford, the Open University, Cambridge, Cranfield, UK Space Agency, and the Satellite Applications Catapult, all in this region. And that's a, an emergent project in this area. So that needs to become part of the ask for government that Jeremy alluded to. And then uh, lastly, uh, but very importantly, the whole area of sustainable aviation. Uh, there was a summit uh, hosted by Cranfield and Boeing just a few months ago, uh, about a month ago, that looked towards the future of aviation, recognizing that the current aviation business model uh, is, is, is really needs a com considerable change as we look to the future with uh, moving towards zero carbon by 2050. Uh, sustainable aviation is a project that I think is ready and uh, ready to go. Uh, it involves many of the institutions across the, uh, the arc, both businesses, government organizations, and our universities. And I'm going to conclude my presentation by asking the second of the video clips to play. Thank you very much indeed. This is a really exciting time 
and we really are on the cusp of a, a technology revolution. The changes we're looking at now are complete uh, changes in configuration. have some of the best businesses in the UK. Aviation is a key sector in the UK's economy and particularly focused around this area. If you look at the region, you look at Oxford, Cambridge, Cranfield, there's some fantastic capability, some fantastic opportunities. We're seeing the challenges of Brexit, we're seeing the challenges of Covid, we're seeing the challenges of sustainability. Where we're going next is we've got to meet the UK targets of zero emissions by 2050. If we can bring together research opportunities and the minds of the entrepreneurs in, in this area. New technologies, new materials, autonomy, new energy sources, electric aircraft, hydrogen fuel cells, sustainable aviation fuel. The complete removal of fossil fuels from flight. There's really nowhere else in the world that this innovation and research can happen. 500 million would see the UK being at the very heart of a future global aviation sector. A lot of work is already underway and that with a bit more investment from the government, from the private sector, we really can start to tackle that, that challenge of net zero flight. The opportunity for the UK to remain at the very heart of the aviation industry is there now. Create investment, create wealth, create jobs. You can use this art as the gateway into the academic research, the research universities from across the UK. To grow and flourish and will enable that prosperity to be spread across the whole of the UK. The great thing is that the industry is starting to accept that we need to solve these problems and we can do it. And unlock the economic potential, unlock the uh, solutions to meet the sustainability goals. It's there. Thank you very much indeed, Bev. Uh, thanks very much, Peter. And, and just <laughs> such incredibly exciting work being done through the ARC Universities Group. Um, and really pleased that the, the ARC Universities Group is such a fundamental part of the collaboration work we've been doing on the ARC uh, in the past and more and more definitely in the future. Um, I'm going to, to, to leave it there for the moment, Sir Peter. I'm going to bring you back and I'm going to bring the other speakers back, if that's okay, for some questions that we've, we've taken a lot of questions. We won't have time for all of them, but I, we'll, we'll go through as many as we are able to. Unfortunately, I have to give apologies from Emran Meehan, uh, Director General uh, MACLG. He had fully intended to be here today, but for some technical details on our end, or technical issues on our end and his end, we weren't able to make that happen. I know he's very disappointed not to have been able to join in today and share his, his support and, and, and enthusiasm for the work that's been done on the prospectus in particular. And I know that's a view shared uh, across the ARC team uh, within government. And um, we'll try and get a statement from, from Emran and the ARC team uh, in response to the, to the questions that we send out to everybody later. So my thanks again to all the speakers and, and I hope the audience is able to understand. And again, because there are 300 and some, some odd of you out there, it's not really easy to have a, an interactive session here in, in a traditional sense. Um, but what I will try to do is grab as many of the questions you brought in as, as broad a range as possible so we can test the speakers uh, over the next, well, over the next 15, 20 minutes before we wrap up. Um, I'm going to start off one, uh, Barry, I'm going to start off one with you that we received. There's a few that are in sort of this sort of same theme, and I just wondered if you could pick it off really, which is there, there are some concerns that, you know, the, the, the arc in and of itself and the, and the working of all this collaborative could somehow cut across local democracy. And, and one of the challenges has been is, do we need this kind of arrangement or can these, the, the, the things and the ambitions that you've been speaking to today um, be achieved uh, through individual council workings or smaller groupings? And I just wondered if you had any comments or thoughts on that, Barry, to start us off. Yeah, certainly. Um, I think those of us who have been involved in uh, local government uh, for uh, uh, any amount of time really know, understand that collaboration is a fundamental aspect of uh, democracy. And we work in several arrangements where it makes sense uh, in the public interest to do so. 
some of those are formal and some are uh, informal. Um, uh, the beauty of local democracy is that any partner um, who feels that that's not in their uh, best interest need not join. It's not uh, compulsory. That doesn't mean uh, individual councils or areas uh, can opt out of the area that we now know has been identified uh, by a nationally elected government to be a key economic significant area. Uh, we feel that it's better to engage and try to positively shape and influence what's going to happen here rather than uh, wait uh, and perhaps be done to. And I think that's really it's the key message that we've tried to uh, bring over um, this afternoon. It's very important um, for all of us to engage, collaborate, uh, find consensus, work together on our joint priorities. And uh, that's uh, the essence of this exercise. Thank, thanks very much, Barry. And then I wonder if there's a bit of a segue over to you, Bridget, on lots of questions on green arc, lots of lots of enthusiasm, but also some challenges, I think is fair. One would be, um, so how are we going to be able to make sure that, that developers or the development industry or, or any indeed anybody follows the principles that we establish on the green arc? How are we going to be able to make sure that this isn't as as one of the uh, the, 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 the correspondents said, is just greenwashing? I, I think there's, you spoke very passionately and there certainly is an intent not to greenwash and I know that from, from being in the sessions but I think for our audience any suggestion as to how you think we're able to secure a, a change and a difference here please. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much uh, Bev. Yeah, so there's a real risk that this will be greenwash. So you know we obviously you know, we need probably changes in primary legislation from government that will allow us to raise uh, the standards of the housing and the um, and employment premises that we build. You know, currently we're we're quite hamstrung in what we can do. So I think that's one strand. The other the other strand is that we've got to work with developers, and I do this a lot, and I'm sure Barry does as well. To you know, get developers to buy into this as well, to see that building the types of houses that the people you know the people want to live in the types of houses that will reduce their cost of living actually creates a market in themselves so if we keep on building houses that are expensive to run uh, poorly connected to where people work you know the, the time will come when people cease buying those houses and they will choose to buy the houses that are built to really high environmental standards and where you know they people can access where they need to go through sustainable means of means of travel so I think we have to play our part in working with developers uh, to manipulate the market. But we, know we, need, we, need, um, we need government to do their bit as well. That, that's helpful, Bridget. And I presume linking back to Barry's point, that is one of the things that's brought the authorities, the, the universities and the LEPs together is because there is some sort of uh, strength in numbers to be able to make those big policy shifts and changes. And I think that's very, very important. And Jeremy, just taking that thought one step forward, um, do you think that the green, the idea of a green arc is somehow contrary to a significant economic growth or, or sustained economic growth for, for, for the arc? And do you see this as more opportunity or threat? Is this something that can be complementary or is this something that's going to eventually, as some people seem to think, be a contradiction? I don't think it's a contradiction at all. Um, I think, as Bridget put it very well indeed earlier, I think it's an absolute win-win. Um, as Bridget has just said, I think people will become increasingly aware, if they're not already aware, of their carbon footprint, uh, their effect uh, on climate and climate change, and they will look in their own ways to play their part, whether that's as a resident or whether that's as an entrepreneur. And if we create across this region somewhere where that focus is equally clear, if someone is choosing as to where they might want to live and bring up their children or want to come and grow a business, that's exactly what will attract uh, the, the future generations. I think it's an enormous opportunity also in business terms, um, as we've now all referred to in our respective uh, presentations. Um, we must recognize the number of new technologies which need to be developed uh, to take account of where we will have to be. Uh, within, within only a short period of time. 
Um, so, so the opportunity for entrepreneurs to come here, recognizing that that research and development is going on in a number of our universities, recognizing that they would have on their own doorstep places to go and trial and pilot some of the things that they might be then bringing forward to the market. This is an ideal place. And one of the things I didn't refer to as much as I might have done earlier on is we have to recognize that from an inward investment point of view, we will increasingly be under competition from many other places in the world. And we need to attract these technologies here. They need to become, this needs to become one of the regions where someone with an idea or with a proposition can feel that they can bring that, they can research it, develop it, they can turn it into something commercial if they wish to, because this is one of the areas where they will receive the greatest support and backing for doing so. Jeremy, I mean, all of, by the way, all of you as a panel are terrific at creating segues to the next speaker, so keep, keep that up, please. Uh, so Peter, then off the back of that, I mean, universities aren't immune to the, to the, to the challenges and ability of attracting talent and, and being able to retain that talent within themselves. Surely there must be an opportunity here then to link that sectoral growth, that growth in your own um, uh, teachings and the, and, and, and the opportunities that come out of the universities to be able to link up with whatever those principles are that's emerging through the arc. And we had a very specific question, which was, you know, is there an opportunity now for the universities to be able to be more proactive in some of its course load to actually be able to influence the outcomes the arc might be looking after? The example that was given to me was around architecture, for example, or around built environment. Is that something you see as an opportunity? Oh, you're on mute, I think, Sir Peter. Right. Um, thanks very much indeed, uh, Bev. So th there are two questions there. Uh, one about attracting talent into the universities. Um, and I can't speak for other universities, but uh, certainly in the three universities that I've been uh, familiar of, of, of running, uh, Cranfield being the third, uh, I think that UK universities are held up extraordinarily highly in the international marketplace. And uh, certainly speaking at Cranfield, I think the quality of applicants to come into the university to, to teach, to research, to be involved in the entrepreneurship type of agenda continues to rise. Uh, that doesn't mean to say it's not tough to keep at that position. Uh, but, you know, we are very fortunate in the language that we te teach in that we are still uh, a very, very highly favoured uh, sector, the UK higher education sector. And then, of course, organisations like Oxford and Cambridge are, of course, at the very pinnacle. So I don't see any problem in attracting high quality talent into the, the universities at all. The business about uh, putting on uh, programs to reflect the marketplace is something that, of course, has been evolving over time. Uh, of course, you know, much of the higher education sector is perceived to be a, a public sector activity run by you know, universities who uh, have a particular number of students and so on that they're allowed to take by government. That of course no longer exists. Uh, you know, students can be uh, can come from anywhere in whatever numbers we want. So universities themselves are the place that thinks about the marketplace within which they work, think about the types of demand for uh, for professionals uh, in the in due course, and at different levels of of skills development different types of skills requirements and then develop their courses to meet that. We have total flexibility in that and we have had for a number of years now um, and, and it's really important that we hear from society within the region, companies within the region, if they think there's a particular type of skill that they want developing then I think the universities would very much want to ensure that that's delivered. That's terrific, so Peter. And I, I, I know you may have to go, but I want to ask you one more question, if I could. Um, what role do you think the government can play in underpinning that research and development support financially? I mean, obviously, it's subsidies and 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 programs. But you know, how important is the government role in 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 sponsoring you know those arc wide programs you so eloquently discussed in your presentation? You know, what what can you elaborate a little bit more on how important a role government needs to play in, in in allowing some of those to prosper and 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 move forward? 
Well, I think right at the moment, uh, circumstances dictate that we have to make some very high level commitments. Uh, clearly, you know, the promises that the Chancellor of the Exchequer has made during the coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, have huge consequences on the financial uh, priorities that the nation will be looking at going forward. I think keeping investing in high quality research, whether it's in the life sciences or uh, zero carbon is absolutely crucial to that. And certainly, you know, there is a very key uh, income line to our research intensive universities relating to to that. Uh, and that's important to 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 con to continue. I think uh, another area that, of course, is is growing hugely is the area of apprenticeships and broadening the higher and further education environment more to be open to uh, the the needs of uh, of our businesses and how they can be used by a combination of experiential learning as well as academic learning and of course that's what a lot of universities are refer are you know are are developing and at Cranfield obviously our initial our initiative in masterships that is apprenticeships at the master's level is is crucial. It's what uh, some sectors need in order to upskill. But that's not a unique initiative. Uh, I think that those are the two things I'd, I'd highlight. Continuing to support the research base and then making sure that so that's building capabilities and then building capacity being driven very much by the business needs across the arc. Peter, thank you for that. And I think, Jeremy, one of the things I wanted to pick up from a question that somebody was asking was um, the challenge, I guess, of what's unique about the ARC? The question was, look, given the leveling up agenda in this country nationally, um, why would there be more emphasis put on this part of the world than on the North, for example? And, and, I, and I wonder, just to lead the witness here, if some of that answer is from, from Sir Peter in the sense that you do have some unique assets here. But um, I wonder if you could elaborate on that, that you know, this idea that can the art play a role in national leveling up as opposed to we should just divert our attention elsewhere? I think that's a very understandable question. And as Sir Peter's just said, <clears throat> at a time like this, I think uh, we all recognize uh, the pressures that there are on many, many communities and the pressures that one believes sadly that will emerge as we come out of the pandemic. Um, but I don't think any of us see it as being one or the other. Um, I think what we do have here is the ability to help the economy, to help the nation. Uh, and I think government does recognise that. Um, there are issues of levelling up, let me say, within our own region. And, and we feel as strongly about those as anyone in respect of our own localities. And we must address those as much as other parts of the country will be pressing government to address those needs elsewhere. But what we do have here is the ability to generate wealth for the region and for the nation. And we are able to look to the future in terms of new technologies. I don't think any of us living our lives as we do would think that we can simply sit back as a country with the industries that have driven our economies in the past. I think all of us recognize in terms of what we're seeking to buy, how we're seeking to live. We know that there are new technologies. We know that we will depend on new medicines, new clinical treatments. We wish to see new forms of transport as all of us are referring to. We must, as a nation, keep up with those technologies. We must generate the ideas and we must create them as commercial missions. Uh, as I said, it's very interesting, I think, that government recognizes the way in which research must be taken forward to enable it to be commercialized and then to create jobs, to create prosperity in our own localities. And that's the enormous opportunity we have here. It, it will help other regions to level up more quickly if what we do here, we do as effectively as we can. Jeremy, I think that's really helpful. And I, I won't come back as a question, Sir Peter, but I think um, if you look at any of the major projects you're talking about, I'm 
reasonably sure of myself that those actually involve universities and establishments beyond the arc. You know, there is no solid line in terms of your research and your influence. And I think that's a that's the point Jeremy picks up very, very well. Um, and Thank thanks very much. And Bridget, it won't surprise you that some people still aren't necessarily 100 percent convinced that if we really want to push a green arc, um, why are we pushing an economic agenda. And, and, and I wonder if you want to speak just maybe a little bit differently than where Jeremy covered earlier about the fact that, you know, we, we, we can, these aren't a contradiction. But I just wonder if you could elaborate on the fact of how these things can be more coterminous in, in terms of having sustainable economic growth, but also having a green arc and why one is not necessarily possible without the other, if, if, if you could elaborate on that perhaps. OK, so I don't think we have all the answers yet. You know, this is a work in progress. Um, but just as, you know, the government is talking about a green recovery from COVID as being, a, you know, a no brainer, um, embedding, embedding the green in every sense of the word, which I spoke about um, earlier, in the, the development and the growth of the arc is, is a no brainer too. So I think you know, I, I can't give answers as to how we can do it, but I think my challenge back would be, why, why wouldn't we do it? You know, there are enormous opportunities here to, um, you know, really, um, to really create an, an exemplar, an environmental exemplar within the, within the arc. Um, and that can, I am absolutely certain, can sit alongside growth you know the, the economic growth as well it's not going to be easy but you know we need we have considerable expertise and once we secure that commitment from government as well then i'm perfectly certain we can deliver it but it's a work in progress if i knew all the answers i wouldn't need the environment working group to uh, to keep on slaving away in order to try and get to the solutions but you know we're making a promise here and um you've got to hold us to those promises Bridget, I think that's really important to reflect on that, you know, while it may seem like we've been at this for a while and it has been for three years for some of us, uh, many of the people on this screen, um, the reality is if you look to some of those other larger regional agglomerations, they've been at this for decades. So, so I think there is a point about there is a progress here of a statement of intent that then gets followed up with action. I think that's what you're talking about. But somebody asked very specifically, um, and I think we know the answer is what are the exact metrics we're using to judge that? And your answer is, well, we don't know yet. That's work we have to do. But there must be a role in developing those metrics and that clarity so that people can hold us to account. Is that something you'd agree to? Absolutely. And I think that's what today is exemplified that, you know, we we are all sharing that that vision to embed the environment in everything we do. You know, it is the biggest opportunity here. And, um, you know, as long as we're all committed, as we all, we all stay true to the vision and, you know, we don't fall foul of compromise um, and, you know, chip, chipping away at the, the purity of that vision, then we will get there. But, you know, my working group can't do it in isolation. The LEPs can't do it in isolation. The universities can't. But together, I'm absolutely convinced that, that we can, as long as, you know, government are there, um, you know, giving us the means, the means to deliver it. Thanks, Barry. Um, one last question before I move on to Barry is, um, somebody was asking about the role telecommuting can play in the future. So, I mean, while we've been talking to you very much about Green Arc, you did touch on the fact that, you know, environment's a cross-cutting theme, really, across many of our pieces of work, not just the economy, but also connectivity and, and movement and mobility. Um, any views on, on the role of telecommuting might be able to play for the Arc in future in terms of how we bring this polycentric region together? No, sorry, so on, on telecommuting? Well, the idea of virtual, very much like this, <laughs> uh, you know, virtual working as opposed to physical, you know, uh, you, all of you have had the pleasure of driving across the arc to one or the other's host authority for a meeting and understand the time it takes to do that. So any thoughts on that? Absolutely. So, you know, we've got to we've got to build digital infrastructure into all of this. You know, we've got to stop building things like railways, which don't have, you know, which aren't associated with the infrastructure for um, for energy, 
uh, for you know digital transmission as well. You know we've got to stop digging up our streets and digging up our countryside multiple times. So we've got to be planning this this all together. So you know if we are building a road, and you know uh, one of the discussions Bev and I have had is that you know we we've got to stop thinking about roads in last century's uh, sense of the word. This has got to be future-proof roads which can take. Um, sustainable autonomous vehicles, complete new generation of transport. This isn't about yesterday, this is about the future. But if we're building something like that, along with it has to go all the digital technology, all the energy uh, transmission as well. We've just got to get really smart about this. Well, I think that's excellent. Thanks very much, Bridget. And Barry, always always um, a tricky one, I'm afraid, but I'm going to give you uh, the, the, the headline question, which is, your thoughts. One of the one of the writers or one of our uh, one of our viewers was asking us. So, what happens with the million homes and the expressway? And 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 they were asking, what is the latest on that? Now, I'm not suggesting you are the 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 oracle of these things, although you very very well may be. But um, I wondered if you had a view as to from 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 this group's perspective where those particular headlines sit. Well. <laughs> most definitely not the oracle but i do have a uh, a view on on these things because they're good questions and it's it's as well to ask them um and they are very much related um i uh, i take the view that the bit of the oxford to cambridge expressway that goes from oxford to mk um uh, that part i take the view that that um is paused um, and, and we know now um, that the Department of Transport and Highways England are looking again at how uh, they might address connectivity uh, differently um, between uh, Oxford and uh, MK. Uh, and they, they're linking that interestingly now um, to how to uh, solve known um, congestion uh, problems on the A34. Uh, south of Oxford and uh, through Oxfordshire. So um, interesting change of tack um, uh, from a national position, good. Um, and what they can now do, of course, um, is uh, look at uh, the prospect of uh, less people um, being on the road because uh, people don't travel to work as much in a post-COVID world. I can see that being the new reality. Uh, and the prospects that we've heard today, the hints today uh, about about driverless cars, about the the new fuels that are uh, coming to, and the prospects uh, for uh, improved, better public transport, and how that takes uh, traffic off the roads. So there's a whole new way to look at and plan um, for uh, road infrastructure. And it's absolutely right that. Uh, um, and in a way, timely um, that uh, Department of Transport, Highways England are uh, reviewing all that. And there is a connection to uh, housing, housing uh, target numbers, which always uh, scare the horses. And those uh, prospects, I think, um, are uh, you need to uh, take a with, I was going to say a pinch of salt, but you need to take those sort of things with a shovel full of salt, really, um, because. Uh, in the in the end analysis, um, uh, I'd like to see uh, an arc where all the young people who are uh, in infant school now uh, and uh, growing up in our area are able to live here if they want to, if they chose to. They're able to live in a good quality, well insulated, uh, in a low low energy cost home, um, well designed home. I'd like them to be able to do that. Um, and I'd like to be able to see a planning system um, facilitate that. And the planning system, of course, meanwhile, back at the ranch, is in a state of flux right now. Last week, can even compared to the week before. Uh, so it will be uh, very interesting um, to see how uh, the results of the consultation on the uh, planning reforms white paper uh, turn now. Uh, into a putative um, planning act and how there's a shift, I think, you can read the runes, there's a shift towards, um, for the sake of argument, um, expanding urban settlements rather than scattergunning loads of new settlements. And so I think that the, uh, 
there's a whole raft of uh, things that are coming down the pipeline which will gel together. The important thing is, isn't it, that if you're going to plan how to uh, facilitate uh, people living where they want to live, if you're going to plan those things, for goodness sake, do it well, do it properly, do it with collaboration and cooperation across planning authorities, uh, and do it in a way where you really enhance, really buy into uh, the messages that were on those videos and the, and the, which Bridget has so effectively uh, infused about today. So there are our uh, challenges. And uh, the bottom line um, for the audience is we are up for um, those challenges. We want to influence things for the better. And uh, why not? Why, why would you not try and do that? I think really uh, that has to be a, uh, a key message um, from this afternoon, Beth. Hey, I couldn't have ended this in any better way. Thank you very much. And that is exactly the point for us here today. It is about being positive and trying to engage to make this um, the place where people would want to be. And, and, and if you are going to be here, why wouldn't you, as you say, make it as good as it possibly could be? And, and, and that underpins our success for the future. I want to very, very much, first of all, thank the panel. I uh, really appreciate your time and, and, and your passion and enthusiasm, I think, should be obvious to everyone um, that this is not a passing fancy. This is something that you feel very, very strongly in, and there's a tremendous opportunity for us. Again, off the words that Barry said of our collaboration working forward and very much working with government as well. Sorry that Emran couldn't be here to echo that, but I believe that's what he would say, that they have been encouraging us to work in a collaborative way with them. And, and that's the opportunity we're going to take going forward. Um, I also want to make sure I thank um, Oxford, OxLEP, Oxfordshire Local Enterprise Partnership, for hosting the, 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 the facility for this today. And Karen Clark from SEMLEP for, for doing so much behind the scenes to help make this happen. And Andrew Bow from Tala, thank you very much. And to you, the audience, thank you for joining us today. We very much hope this is the start of a conversation. We've been offering and, and talking about this conversation for some time. We plan on carrying on with it. And we'll be out very, very soon again to talk about more of the work priorities that we're doing going forward. So uh, only for me to say goodbye and, uh, and take care. Thank you very much.